Good day. In this lecture dealing with topic 2.3 and topic 4, that is methods of payment, in other words, letters of credit, and instruments of finance, in other words, letters demand guarantees, we look at the last part of a three-part series on these instruments. In part 3, we focus on the risk aspect, the unfair and abusive calling of these instruments, particularly the exceptions to the autonomy principle. In this lecture, we consider whether or not a breach of a negative stipulation constitutes an exception to the autonomy principle. We look at a recent judgment delivered by the Supreme Court of Appeal on the matter. The purpose of online discussions is to merely guide you through certain parts of the module. It is by no means a comprehensive discussion of all the material you need to study. With the online discussions, we focus on making it easier for you to study and work through the different topics. It is ultimately your responsibility to master each topic. Please check my UNISA for additional material that may be prescribed during the year. Before we start, it is important to refresh the basic principles of demand guarantees and letters of credit. The idea in a letter of credit transaction or a demand guaranteed transaction is that if the documents presented are in line with the terms of the credit or the guarantee, the issuer or the guarantor, for example, a bank, has to pay, and if the documents do not correspond to the requirements, it must not be paid. That is referred to as the documentary nature of these instruments. Letters of credit and performance or demand guarantees are all treated as autonomous or independent undertakings. Operation will not be interfered by the courts on grounds immaterial to the guarantee or credit itself. We refer to that as the independence or autonomy principle of these instruments. Now, these instruments are in strong contrast to the surety ship guarantee. The surety ship guarantee is an undertaking to be answerable for another's debt or default, and it is triggered only by proof of actual default and is not independent of the underlying contract like demand guarantees and letters of credit are. Now, there's a limited number of exceptions to the autonomy principle. In other words, in certain circumstances, the autonomy of the demand guarantee or letter of credit may be ignored by the bank or the other guarantor or issuer, and regard may be had to the terms and condition of the underlying contract, for example, a construction contract or a sale agreement. The main exceptions concern fraud and illegality in the underlying contract. Some countries, for example, Singapore, Malaysia and Australia, accept other exceptions to the underlying contract. For example, that the underlying contract is a nullity or that a party has made himself guilty of unconscionable conduct. It is a valid offence where the guarantor or issue of a demand guarantee or letter of credit refuses to pay if the demand or documents are defective or submitted late. This does, however, not create an exception to the independence principle and is merely a non-complying demand. Fraud is the only internationally accepted exception to the autonomy principle. Courts take the view that it is for the guarantor to make up its own mind whether to refuse payment on the grounds of fraud or forgery. The issuer is obliged to pay where a compli compliant demand for payment is made and the evidence of fraud is insubstantial. However, if the forgery or falsification appears from the face of the documents, the issuer or the guarantor is permitted to refuse payment even without a court interdict. Now, there is no international consensus as to whether a breach of a provision in the underlying contract or the separate or a separate agreement, referred to as a breach of a negative stipulation, constitutes a further exception to the autonomy principle of demand guarantees. Both English and South African courts accept that the beneficiary may be interdicted from making a claim on a bond in breach of a negative stipulation, either expressly or impliedly. The latest South African court case on the matter is joint venture and Straubach versus South African National Roads Agency. In the next slide, slides, we will focus on the case in more detail. Now, in August 2017, a joint venture between Aveng and Straubach was concluded. They concluded a contract with South African National Roads Agency, or Sunroll, to construct a river bridge on the N2 Wild Coast Toll Road in the Eastern Cape. Joint venture 
the applicant in the case caused the performance guarantee subject to South African law to be issued by Lombard Insurance Company in favour of Sunroll Beneficiary. Now, the performance guarantee inter alia contained very important clauses. Clause 3 provided that the guarantor, Lombard, undertakes and agrees to pay the beneficiary a certain sum of money or some po such portion as may be demanded on receipt of a written demand from the beneficiary, which demand may be made by the beneficiary if, in your opinion and at your sole discretion, the applicant fails and or neglects to commence the work as prescribed in the contract or if he fails and or neglects to proceed therewith or if for any reason he fails and or neglects to complete the services in accordance with the conditions of the contract or if he fails and neglects to refund the beneficiary any amount to be paid that is due and payable to the beneficiary or if his estate is sequestrated or if he surrenders his estate in terms of the insolvency law in force within the Republic of South Africa. Clause 4 provided, subject to the above and without any way detracting from the beneficiary's right to adopt any of the procedures set out in the contract, the said demand can be made by beneficiary at any stage. Clause 6 provided, this guarantee is neither negotiable nor transferable and, subsection C, clause C provided, shall not be interpreted as extending the guarantor's liability to anything more than payment for the amount guaranteed. The construction contract, in other words, the underlining contract, also, con also contained important clauses. And the important clause is subclause 4.2 that regulated the circumstances under which a beneficiary could make a demand for payment under the guarantee. The clause read as follows. The beneficiary shall not make a claim under the performance security except for an amount to which the beneficiary is entitled under the contract in the event of a failure by the applicant to extend the validity of the performance guarantee as prescribed in the preceding paragraph, in which event the beneficiary may claim the full amount of the performance security. B. Failure by the applicant to pay the beneficiary an amount due. C. Failure by the applicant to remedy a default after receiving the beneficiary's notice requiring the default to be remedied. Or D. Circumstances which entitle the beneficiary to terminate under subclause 15.2 that is termination by the beneficiary, irrespective of whether the note of, of termination has been given. Now, the beneficiary shall indemnify and hold the applicant harmless against and from all damages, losses and expenses, including legal fees and expenses resulting from a claim under the performance security to the extent to which the beneficiary was not entitled to make the claim. Now, subclause 15.2 referred to deals with the construction contract and it refers to instances where the beneficiary could terminate the contract either on the ground that the applicant, applicant neglected to comply with the notice to correct, had abandoned the construction or showed its intention not to continue performance of its obligations. Now later the relationship between the beneficiary and the applicant deteriorated in 2018. It led to the termination of the contract. In short, there were various incidences of disruption, some violent, and no construction was performed from 22 October 2008. As a result, the beneficiary often had to suspend the work between October and January 2019. These work pauses, event these work pauses eventually caused applicant to give beneficiary a notice indicating its intention to terminate the contract, effective seven days after the notice. The applicant contended that civil unrest and turmoil at the construction site constituted force majeure, as described and catered for in the construction contract, preventing it from performing the works in accordance with the contract terms, thus having given notice of termination. The applicant deemed itself entitled to be released from further performance of its obligations under the contract. In contracts, the beneficiary denied the existence of force majeure, but even if it did, that had come to an end on 9 January 2019 after a meeting with the local community. The beneficiary instructed the applicant to resume construction on 14 January 2019, but applicant refused to do so. The beneficiary also contested that applicant was enti entitled to terminate the contract and instructed applicant to withdraw its notice of the termination and return to the site, failing which beneficiary would exercise its right to terminate the contract. 
The applicant refused and accordingly the beneficiary also purported to terminate the contract. The dispute as to whether dis the disruptions at the site constitute force majeure, entitling the applicant to terminate the contract was referred to arbitration in accordance with the terms of the construction contract. In the meantime, the applicant requested the beneficiary's pledge that pending the arbitration proceedings, it would not make a demand for payment on the guarantee. The beneficiary refused and indicated it would make a demand. Therefore, the applicant applied to the Gauteng Division of the High Court Pretoria for uh, interdict, restraining the beneficiary from making a demand on the guarantee until the outcome of the arbitration proceedings. The applicant contended that the beneficiary's demand would be unlawful as it had not met certain conditions in the underlying contract, in other words, the construction contract, which limited its right to call up the guarantee. The court of first instance did not decide whether the beneficiary's right to make a demand on the guarantee was limited in the underlying contract. The judge merely remarked in passing that had it been the only issue that she had to determine, she would have decided in its favor in its favor of the applicant. However, based on the facts before her, she concluded that the applicant had failed to make a prima facie case that the disruption of the construction constituted force majeure. Thus, she dismissed the applicant's application with costs. The applicant appealed to the South African Supreme Court of Appeal. The guarantor did not take part in the appeal and filed a notice to abide by the decision of the court. The Supreme Court of Appeal agreed with and upheld the independent nature of the performance guarantee and letter of credit, as the Court of First Instance had also done. The Supreme Court of Appeal, however, suggested that the South African law should be developed to recognize an exception to that, where the underlying contract limits or qualifies a beneficiary's right to make a demand on the guarantee, an applicant, for example a contractor, should not in, be entitled to, in, to interdict the beneficiary from doing so until the conditions of the underlying contract has been met. It was exactly this exception that the applicant proposed would apply in the case before the Supreme Court of Appeal. Therefore, the main issue for determination was whether the beneficiary was restricted by subclause 4 to subsection D of the underlying contract from demanding payment under the performance guarantee. The judgment the Supreme Court of Appeal referred to Union Carriage case, where a full court remarked in passing that if parties agreed in the underlying contract not to make a demand on the letter of credit before a specific event and the beneficiary still sought to exact payment, the beneficiary would be guilty of fraud. However, the question did not specifically arise in Union Carriage as there was no assertion of such an agreement. The Supreme Court of Appeal also referred to two other cases where the beneficiary were prohibited from drawing on the demand guarantee, but where the prohibitions were set forth in the underlying contract. Thus, the court determined these two cases did not find application in the matter before it. The Supreme Court of Appeal then referred to quick space case where a similar issue had arisen. However, a major, a major difference in that Quick space was where the guarantees were issued by South African law and were also subject to the South African, South African courts, while the underlying contract incorporated the Australian standby general conditions of contract and they were made subject to the law of Australia. Therefore, the South African Supreme Court of Appeal, per Judge Clutter, in quick space had applied the Australian law and reply, relied on Australian case law. Now, a special reference was made to a statement made by Judge Clutter in Quick Space where he had said, It therefore seems to me that it can be said with sufficient certainty that Australian law is to the following effect. A building contract may, without alleging fraud, restrain the person from who he had convicted for the performance of the work from presenting to the issuer a performance guarantee unconditional in its terms and issued person to the building contract if the contractor can show that the other party to the building contract would breach a term of the building contract by doing so. But the terms of the building contract should not readily be interpreted as conferring such a right. Now the Supreme Court of Appeal also referred to another case, an Australian and 
English cases, particularly if they refer to the Simon Coves case, where English court had stated that fraud is not the only ground upon which a demand on a grantee could be restrained by injunction, but also where the underlying contract clearly and expressly prevented the beneficiary from making a demand under the guarantee. The court said, for the purposes of the case before it, it was willing to assume that there is room in South African law to follow the same path as that taken in Australia and English law, provided that the caveat provided in quick space quoted above is adhered to, namely that an applicant could show that a beneficiary would be breaching a term of the construction contract by making a demand and a court not just readily construed a term of the construction contract as conferring such a right. The court stressed that this caveat should generally provide the basis to resolve the inner ring tension between a performance guarantee, normally re required in instances such as the case before the court, and an underlying contract that includes some asserted limitation. However, the court noted that given the significance of performance guarantees and letters of credit in international trade and commerce, such claims are made by by the applicant in relation to the underlying contract should be approached with caution. As to the guarantee itself, the, the, the court held that the words were, were the wording was in, instructive and held. The guarantor was obliged to pay on receipt of a written demand from the beneficiary, which could be made if, in the beneficiary's opinion and sole discretion, the applicant had failed and or neglected to commence the work as prescribed, or if it had failed and or neglected to proceed therewith, or if for any reason the applicant fails and or neglects to complete the services in accordance with the condition of the contract. And the catch-all provision was very important. The applicant's failure to complete the project, be it due to force majeure or otherwise fails into his falls into this category. In other words, the reason for such failure is irrelevant. That the applicant considers itself to have been prevented by force majeure is immaterial as far as this provision is concerned. The court found that the applicant had failed to prove that the parties had intended anything other than the beneficiary would be entitled to payment before any underlying dispute between them was settled. Therefore, the appeal was dismissed with costs. The Supreme Court of Appeal acknowledges that the law should be developed to recognize the underlying contract exception or a breach of a negative stipulation, as it's sometimes referred to, under South African law. But only if it is proven by an applicant that a beneficiary would be breaching a term of the underlying contract by making a demand and a court did not easily read that into the contract. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court of Appeal does not elaborate on what precisely such an exception would entail. For instance, does the court view it a traditional type of exception to the independence principle, similar to that of clear fraud? Or does it rather constitute an exception that would justify the granting of an interdict, for instance, preventing a demand for payment that would only be valid between the parties to the underlying contract? The Supreme Court of Appeal drew no distinction between an interdict, interdict attempting to limit a beneficiary from making a demand, where doing so would breach a term of the underlying contract, versus one seeking to strain a guarantor from making payment when confronted with an otherwise compliant demand in the same circumstances. It merely implies that such an exception, if proven, could permit an applicant to prevent a beneficiary from making a demand until the conditions in the underlying agreement have been met. However, in this matter before the Supreme Court of Appeal, the applicant had failed to prove that such an exception existed. Therefore, one will have to wait and see how the South African courts deal with similar matters and develop the underlying contract exception or a breach of a negative stipulation exception. For an interesting article that fully discusses the joint venture case, see Kelly Lowe and Fayer's The Breach of a Negative Stipulation as an Exception to the Autonomy Principle in England and South Africa in the Journal of Contemporary Roman Dutch Law. For reasons given in this article, the author, the author suggests that no further type of exception to the autonomy principle is created by the court's acceptance of this.
but rather a distinct type of case is created, which calls for resolution by the parties to the underlying contract. They explain in the article the further exception and how it arrived in these two jurisdictions. The authors examine the principle that underlines it and points out any differences there may be from the fraud exemption. Thank you very much.